house. So good to have you online. Welcome to God and the City. And uh, what a great day it is to be in the house. And so glad that you made it and you joined us this morning. We're gonna take a few moments to pray. Let me read this scripture and uh, I wanna encourage you. Uh, in the midst of all the journey is through uh, this season, and the great thing about seasons is that seasons pass. And no matter what you and I are facing, whether it's uncertainty or you're in lockdown and feel like a bear in a cage, this season will pass. You're gonna come through this. God is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He promises to protect us and to be our refuge. Have a look in Psalm 91, a great Scripture uh, that you can read and put your eyes on. This Scripture is written for us to speak. And uh, it's actually, we've got a big sign on the side of our building outside. And the other day uh, I walked past uh, out the front of our building and I saw a lady with a shopping bag that stopped to read the sign and uh, had a chat with her and she loves reading it. She said she reads it every time she walks past our building and it says, you who sit down in God's presence, God's most high, says spend the night in the, uh, uh, the, the shadow's sh shadow. It says, say this, and this is a Scripture, it says, say this, God is my refuge. I shall trust in You and I'm safe. That's right, He rescues you from hidden traps, shields you from deadly hazards. His huge outstretched arms protect you. Wherever you are, say you. God is protecting you. This is what the Bible promises. He is gonna protect you. It says, under them you are perfectly safe. Say, I'm safe, I'm protected. He, uh, his arms fend off all harm. Fear nothing, not wild wolves in the night, not flying arrows of the day. No disease that prowls through the darkness. No disaster that erupts at high noon, even though others succumb all around, drop like flies to the left and the right. No harm will even graze you and you'll stand untouched, watch it from a distance. Because God is your refuge. That was the message version. I know you're looking at the NIV, but pretty much says that no disease will harm you. God is gonna protect you. He's gonna be with you. And uh, I love how that Scripture opens and it says, say this. I want you to read that Scripture this week, every morning, speak that out over your house, over the atmosphere of our city, over your children, over your business, over all that you do. God is my refuge. The great thing about God is that He never changes. But when you speak His Word, those words go out and they create and they shift the atmosphere and the world around us. Because God is a creative God and His Word is all powerful. His Name is above every name. It's above every disease. It's above every diagnosis. It's above every emotion, whether you're feeling a bit blue or a bit flat or a bit disappointed or anxious. It's above all that. You and I rise when we speak the Word of God over our atmosphere. We rise when we pray and we seek the Word. We speak that Word over our house, over our family. You're shifting atmospheres because you're bringing heaven to earth through the gate of heaven, which is you, the church. We're gonna pray. Father, I thank You for everyone online, our friends and family, those that we may never have met, people who are new today, every visitor. Lord, we pray the hand and the protection of Jesus Christ over their life. I thank You for Your peace, filling our hearts as we worship You. We thank You for Your power manifesting to cover and protect. We release the favour of God, of every career, of every business, over finances. We thank You for every marriage, God, every family. We strengthen them. Lord, every young person, every single person. God, I pray community of the believers. Lord, as we connect with each other, ring and text and email, FaceTime. We thank You for the community of the house going beyond our walls with the love of God. I thank You for every C3 Cares hamper that's going out this week and last week. Thousands of people being touched by the love of God. We thank You, Lord, for Your presence right now in this house of every family. I pray right now, every person that is watching that may even be away from the Lord, today's the day they come back. In Jesus' Name. And everybody said, Amen. Fantastic. Well, welcome to church today. It's exciting because we're still committed to running our women's conference later on in the year called She Is. 
And uh, that is in, um, on the 11th and the 12th of September with Catherine Ruinala, She Conference. And uh, a few days before that, we're running a huge event, Gospel in Garments, which is an incredible fashion show, uh, which my wife is gonna be speaking at and uh, unpacking a whole lot of stuff. And that's gonna reach people with the garments that we put on in Christ. And so you can buy those tickets online. So register online for those. That's coming up in September 9 and 10. And uh, also later on in October, mid-October, around about the 14th, we got Pastor Mike Connell coming for our Freedom Conference here in Sydney in God and the City. And so we're gonna believe that we're gonna be through this COVID, through this lockdown. Mike Connell's coming down and we're gonna have a great, great, great conference, bringing freedom, bringing hope, helping people in every area, equipping pastors and leaders. Hey, uh, before we move on, I wanna encourage us in our giving uh, in this season. And uh, I've got a great scripture here in Psalm 78. It's so important when we see the word remember, we relook at it with fresh eyes because so often we forget the things we should remember and we remember the things that we should forget. God wants us to remember who He is and what His nature is. And Psalm 78, verses 41, it says, Yet again and again, they tempted God. The people of God, they tempted God. It says they limited God. They limited the Holy One of Israel and they did not remember His power. What a, what a thought. They did not remember His power. And then it says the day when He redeemed them from the enemy. When Israel left Egypt, they faced the Red Sea. It looked uncrossable. They accused Moses and God of bringing them to a place where they thought they'd be slaughtered and doomed. But God miraculously came through and He saved the day and He delivered them and opened up the Red Sea. Then they entered the desert and they became thirsty. And they go back to God. Why did you bring us here? Let's go back to Egypt. This place is terrible. He's trying to set them free. And they didn't believe that God would find them water. But He opened up a rock and Moses struck the rock and sweet water flowed out of the rock. Then they came to a lake. The water was bitter. Throw the cross, throw the branch into the lake and suddenly the water became drinkable. Moses had sweetened the water with a miracle. God's generosity always breaks through into our needs. They complained about eating manna every day that fell from heaven. So God says, I'll give you meat. And He dumped quail. Millions and millions of quail birds fell. Incredible miracle. See, when you and I limit God, we limit His power. When we don't remember who He is, we limit Him. When we limit Him, we limit His power. Part of His power is His ability to provide for you because He's a loving Father and He loves you. When we forget His power, the first thing that goes is we forget His redemptive nature. It says they did not remember His power the day when He redeemed them from the enemy. You and I need to know that the person that we're giving to God is far more powerful than anything else we're gonna face. Every season, every lockdown, every disease, every fear, every anxiety, every situation in your finances or career, your God whom you're giving to every week is far more powerful than everything that you and I face. When we have real big problems, we can get snowed under and we forget that God is a real big God. In fact, God is bigger than your problems. One of the greatest ways we can trust the Lord is to give. Don't forget to tell your problem that God is much bigger. I do that every single week when I give. No matter what I'm facing, I'm gonna make a decision to give because my God is bigger than my lack or my season where things might be a little bit tight or whatever. I still make a decision to give because I know my God, every time I do that, I remember His power, I remember His redemption, and I know that breakthrough is coming. I know breakthrough is coming over your life. 
I know breakthroughs coming over your finances because you keep walking and giving and trusting the Lord. That makes room for God to move in your world. Over in Corinthians, it says the word remember about something else. It says, remember, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows generously will reap in abundance. You know, all through the Bible, we see people who faced impossible circumstances with lack or they felt like grasshoppers. No matter what happened, whether it's David and Goliath and whatever, God always comes through. You might feel dwarfed by your problems or dwarfed by your enemies or in shock about what's happening. I wanna tell you right now, your God is large and in charge. He is far bigger than everything you and I are gonna face. And I want us to pray as we give. To give, you just click on the link that we texted you or you can go to godinthecity.com and click on the giving button and press give and you can tick, tick on the tithes and offerings. Of all the things we remember about God, that He loves us and He's for us, you need to remember that He provides for us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's pray as we give. Father, I thank You today for Your incredible provision over our house. I thank You for the generosity and the big heartedness of this house. I thank You for our people, Lord, for their faithfulness and their diligence and their commitment to give to the house of the Lord the God of the house. Lord, I pray blessing and provision, breakthrough and miracles in Jesus' Name. And bless the mighty people of God and the city. Amen, amen, amen. We're gonna uh, take a minute and uh, hear Jess's story of a great young girl in our church who has uh, seen absolute transformation by the power of God. Let's check out Jess's story right now. So I moved to Sydney in February, no, January last year. I was, you know, coming out of a period, a long period of uh, wandering away from God. It was difficult. I'd had a broken previous relationship, um, but I was really thirsty to seek Him. And I actually ended up a few weeks after I moved to Sydney meeting the lovely James. Um, he was a spirit-led, very spirit-led Christian who, who uh, came to God in the city. So I moved and I started going to this large Anglican church in the hills, uh, which was wonderful and lovely people, really hospitable. But when COVID uh, happened, the church had shut down. I was only there for six weeks before that kind of happened and I really struggled to connect. It was difficult because I was trying to seek God and figure out the hurts in my past. And, you know, it was difficult when you didn't have the support there that, the, that, that you needed. Uh, when you're going to a church regularly and you're connected. But as I started dating James, I was drawn into his community, um, which is, you know, God in the city. And I was invited to have dinner with pastors Tim and Kira Lee at their home. I didn't go to their church, but they welcomed me with such open arms. And there I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I was baptised in the Holy Spirit and uh, I was able to speak in tongues three days later, which was amazing. Not long after, James and I were watching an online service and worshipping at home. Um, and the, the sermons for Vision Builders started, started coming up and I remember just feeling so convicted and drawn to the vision and the message of it that I knew that I needed to call God in the city my home. So I started coming to God in the City as a member of the church in June 2020. And since then, I have been healed physically uh, from a chronic bowel illness that caused incredible pain and restrictiveness in my life. I've got a scholarship to study at Bible College and I'm being equipped in the Word. And I also got engaged to my now fiance, James. Uh, so many of these things wouldn't have been possible without Vision Builders, which creates the space to enable these transformations which Christ calls us to. Wow, that is an incredible story. I love that story. And it gets even better because Jess and Mez got married last week, which was phenomenal and uh, it was a very small, intimate service. They happened to live with the minister who married them. Big shout out to Jess and Mez if you're home watching, and uh, congratulations from everyone at Golden City. 
we're thrilled for you. I love the heart of Vision Builders that it's all about transform lives. And uh, so many of you got stories. If you've got a story of transformation of how you've been impacted in your giving or in your receiving uh, something and the, the love of God through our church, please send us an email to visionbuilders at godinthecity.com.au. We'd love to hear your story. And uh, it's so powerful when we celebrate and we actually honour the stories and the things that God does. And Sometimes we think that, oh, it's not that significant, oh, I'm not that important. You start writing down and recalling and remembering all the things that God's done for you, and you'll find you've got a story, and that's a testimony, and that's enabled you to overcome. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony, our story. When you tell your story, something powerful happens. That it puts like strength into thousands of people who get to hear that story. So I wanna encourage you, Send us your story. Uh, we're going to send you a Vision Builders update in the mail this week. And uh, one of the greatest ways to fulfill your Vision Builder commitments is to do it every, every week, every month. Pay regular commitments as we journey through that. We're praying for you guys. God bless you. And uh, today, well, I'm so excited because we have Pastor Gordon Moore from C3 Bridgman Downs. Gordon, his wonderful wife and family, pioneered that church over 30 something years ago. And uh, it is a significant church in our nation, thousands and thousands of people. And uh, I've had the great honour and privilege of preaching in that church on a number of occasions. And it is by far one of the best churches I've ever preached in. And uh, every time I go there, I just feel incredible warmth and family. The feeling of family in the church is phenomenal. Plus, they've got a huge cafe restaurant out the front and climbing jungle gyms and everybody's wonderful and when I went to that church, I thought, you know what, I could go to this church, it's amazing. And uh, that is a testament to uh, Gordon and Joe, who have built a great church and recently handed over a few years ago to uh, Andrew McGruther, who has taken that over as the second generation senior minister. And uh, they're doing a phenomenal job. And uh, this morning, we're gonna continue our series on work and worship and what it is to go to work and how we act and how we worship God in our work, where we spend so much time and I know that this message is gonna help you uh, and gonna equip you to understand and to process how God wants to move through you and also how the house of God has such an integral part to the foundation of us becoming equipped with the attitudes of Christ and the mind of Christ and the principles of God as the church, we're called to go into the world. The purpose of the house is to equip you to go into the world. And so in this message, you're gonna hear about how we're equipping you to go into the world so we understand why we do what we do. And so it's a great message. Gordon's a great teacher. And a big shout out to Gordon, I think, is on our chat this morning. So God bless your church. Let's enjoy this message by Dr. Gordon Moore from C3 Bridgman Downs. God bless, I'll see you soon. Good morning, C3, God in the City, and Pastor Tim and Curly Lowe and the awesome team and members in the city of Sydney. Wow, we live in interesting times, don't we? But we know this, the Lord Jesus Christ is still on the throne. The church of God is still healthy and growing, and you're doing an incredible work. And as we share today online, I want us to unpack the subject of our calling. I wanna talk about our calling to be seekers, builders, and bringers. Are you ready to go? Okay, here we go. Let's all turn in our Bibles. If you've got them online or you've got them, whatever, check it out. 1 Chronicles twenty two nineteen. Now determine in your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Therefore, arise and build the Lord's sanctuary or the house of God so that you may bring in the ark. Seek, build, bring. Now, you know, in many ways and senses, none of us are exempt from the culture that we live in. Some of it rubs off, most of it unintentional. But we've got to realise that we live in a culture that runs counter often to the teachings of the Scriptures and where God would lead us. And once we get that sorted out in our head, then we're okay. 
Like, I'm into being relevant or contemporary, and that's the sort of church we've built. But never mistake that for compromise. Never, never mistake that for, oh, I'm just going to do what everyone else is doing. The moment we think like that, we're out of sync with God. We're running counter to our prevailing culture. Let me talk about one aspect of our culture. Our culture has so many good things about it. I'd rather be living in New Zealand in a democracy than in a communist country, for instance. Hallelujah. Because I'm free to practice religion. I'm free to do whatever, meet, you know. But we've got to be aware that every upside has a downside. One of the things about our culture is we do live in a culture that is performance and result orientated. We tend to put value on ourselves as an individual by the letters after our name or the house we own or the car we drive or how much money we have in the bank so we feel secure, etc., etc. That can sneak into the church. And what we can find as Western Christians, we think that our ministry or our ability to pray or how much we give is our calling. So in other words, what am I called to do? Well, if I'm not called to be a pastor or leader, then I can't be called of God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we're all called of God. We all have a ministry to fulfil. But we, we tend to narrow it down to a definition because in our culture, that's what we do. So you say to a person, hey, 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 what's your name? You know, oh, it's John. You know, oh, that's awesome. The next question, people, what do you do? That's the, that's the first question. And people say, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm an accountant, I'm a teacher, I'm a politician, although today you probably wouldn't say that much, but, uh, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we put value on what we do. And while what we do is important, we've got to understand what the Bible's teaching here. He's, he's speaking to David, who's not a priest. So one of the things we've got to understand is from the word go, the house of God was never built by priests. It, it was built by builders and shepherds and businessmen and women and a king. And after they built it, they brought the priesthood into it to make it run. <laughs> but very rarely will you find priests actually building something. It's amazing. So somehow we get away from that and in the modern world, oh, it's the pastor's job to build the church. I just turn up. See, all that thinking has to go and we've got to start seeing that we are the church. And let's for a moment put aside whether you're a leader, a preacher, a servant, a muso, whatever, and just say, I'm a child of God. What am I called to do? Number one, be a seeker of God. Number two, to be a builder of the house of God. And number three, to bring the presence of God. They are the three things we're all called to do. And we need to get away from Oh, I'm a preacher or I'm a teacher or whatever. Let's put that aside. We're all called to do this. Amazing. We're called to be seekers of God, builders of the house of God and bringers of the presence of God. So let's look at these three things. Number one, what does it mean to be a seeker of God? What does that actually mean? Well, it means our first priority is God. It's really interesting, Pastor, when you were talking about the rich, run, rich young ruler, Jesus asked him the, the, the last nine commandments. He didn't mention the first one. Did you see that? Because this young man wasn't a seeker of God. He wanted to be saved. He wanted to be secure, right? But he actually wasn't a seeker of God because Jesus didn't ask him, who should you love first? He said, oh, I went on to, you know, adultery, uh, covetousness, blah, blah, blah. He said, I've kept all of those. He said, yeah, but there's one you haven't. It's the first commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he, see, he was, the Lord wasn't first. You and I, our number one calling is Jesus first. We are to be seekers of God. We are to love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and all our strength. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added. To have a house, to have a car, to have a family, to have a, a ministry, to lead it. They're all add-ons. They come after we put God first. And I, this is what I actually believe. If we aren't seekers of God first, those gifts and those add-ons become quite dangerous. 
because they're not coming from the right motive. They're not coming from that seeking of God. We are called to seek God. Hebrews says this in 11 verse 6, Now without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For the one who draws near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those that diligently seek Him. To be a seeker of God means there's diligence. Because again, I find the badge, the badge of modern Australian living, I'm busy. I'm so busy. How, you say, how are you going? Oh, mate, snowed under. How's your life? Oh, busy. And that's like a badge? No, it's not. It's a burnout territory. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not to be too busy to seek God. We're seeking God first. So we don't just pray, we're prayers. What is that? Well, see, a person who prays might turn up at a prayer meeting or a church service and when pastors let's pray, they pray, but that's the only time they pray during the week. So the rest of the week, not even talking to God, not even listening to God, but they pray in church. See, that's someone who prays. But a prayer is someone who's praying 24 seven. You're talking to God. What does it mean? Prayer fullness means you're full of prayer. It means to bring God into your world from the day, moment you wake up. Oh, thank you, God, for a beautiful day. Come downstairs and your wife's prepared bacon and eggs and muffins every morning. <laughs> and I just walk in. Thank you, Jesus. During the day, you're talking to God during the day. You find yourself in the car asking God questions. Something good happens to you, you thank Him. That's what it means to be a prayer, a prayerful person. It means we're just living, and I like the word conversational prayer. And you know, I'm into prayer meetings. I love them, man. I think the church getting together to pray is awesome. But you know what's more important is a conversational walk with God. Wouldn't it be good? Just think about this. Before we said it, we talked to God about it. Just before we're going to go, man, I'm going to tell you something. You just talk to God, God, is this really helpful? You know, what do you think about this? And the Lord will often say to you, I don't know if He says it to you, but He often says to me, shut up. <laughs> don't say it. Don't, don't say it. So you just go, okay. See, that's that prayerfulness, just walking with God. How much good would that do? To live like that. That's what it means to be a seeker of God. We're not just servants, our servers, we're servants. We don't just serve on a roster. Our whole life is serving. And you know, I've discovered about serving. No one minds being a servant until somebody treats you like one. <laughs> we're not just seeking, we're seekers. We're looking for God. We're like the kid's book, Where's Wally? You give a kid a Where's Wally book and they're trying to go, Where's Wally? We need to be like that with God. It's like a computer. Always have your seeking of God mode on. Have it all switched on from the moment you wake up. And you just find you'll, you'll walk on a whole new level, a seeker of God. Number two, a builder of the house of God. As we said before, all God's people from day one were part of building the house of God. You can read it right from Genesis and you read about Jacob and many people look at him at the end of his life, Israel, and you know, he's this great person. He was not a great person. As a matter of, he was a nasty person. You've heard me talk about him before. He was Danny DeVito in the movies. He, 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 he was a nasty piece of goods. But I'll tell you what, he discovered God. And when he discovered God, he discovered the house of God. And the house of God became his priority and he became one of the greatest patriarchs in the Bible. Jacob, he became Israel. Awesome, isn't it? It says in Chronicles 22.5 that we are to build God's house and make it exceedingly great, famous and glorious in every land. What does that mean? Because we know in the Old Testament, a lot of that was physical. It was a physical portrayal of what would be spiritual. What does that look like? Well, we're working together with God 
to build, develop and encourage and grow His church, His people. So many people in the West, they say, are you going to church? That's the language. That's a culture we've got to break because it comes from a traditional idea that the building is the church. But the, this building isn't the church. You and I are the church. We are the church. We're the body. So why do we have church buildings? Because it rains. It's quite logical while you have a building. Uh, it gets hot in, in, in Queensland, so it's nice to have air conditioning. So people say, well, what's the spiritual significance? We can talk about that in a minute. But our first priority is to build each other. We're here to build the church spiritually. And we do this in two ways. Number one, we reach out from the church, from us, to our unchurched friends, family, associates, and we find ways that we can share our story, our testimony, and share the gospel through our lives. The second way that we do it is we reach within the church. And here are some great opportunities this week. Groups coming to church like this, not just rushing off home, but staying in the cafe and connecting with people and encouraging one another. When you do that, you are building the church spiritually. Now, can you see, referring back to what I said, how that building a natural building facilitates that ministry. So I've been to churches and they spend all the money on the sanctuary and there's no cafe. So people after the church, um, oh yeah, bye, and everyone goes. But we've always said when we finish the service, it's half time. So we've got the worship and the spiritual teaching and giving and all that spiritual atmosphere and praying for the sick. Awesome, isn't it? But after the meeting, we go out into a beautiful cafe and have a coffee and laugh with people, encourage people, ask people how they've been going. It's marvellous. So the natural and the spiritual are working together. See, this concept is the concept of incarnation. God always incarnates the spiritual into a physical dimension. Isn't that amazing? You say, oh, where does He do that? I just showed you one. So here's a physical galaxy. He puts the symbol of the cross at the core of a galaxy. I mean, what's God doing? He's sending out His message. God's always sending out His message from the spiritual to the natural. So no wonder the Bible says, I can actually get a sense of what you are doing spiritually by what I see you doing practically or naturally. So that's why the Bible says, if I say I love Mike Johns and he's my brother and I pray and I'm spiritual, but I never give him a phone call. I never send him a greeting for his birthday. He gets sick, I go, he'll, he's a tough old guy, he'll survive. No, no, no. If I say I love him, when it's his birthday, I'm ringing him. When he's in hospital, I'm there. That, that, that's what it means to incarnate. We experience the spiritual love of God, but James says, what good is it if I don't practically show it? See, this is how God thinks. For God so loved the world. Would you say God's love is eternal and spiritual? Yes. So what did He do? He gave His only Son. God became flesh and blood. God came to us. That's how much He loved us. So we are called, all of us, to build the church spiritually and physically. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, by the way, uh, your job is to encourage or sing and your job is to teach and you're, you're a leader and you're, you're, you're an admin and you're a muso and you're a doctor and you're this and you're a... Oh, okay. So you see, we all have a part, we all have a fit, but it's got to come out of this calling. And I believe that's the power of the church and what the New Testament church is really all about. It was never about a leader or one person. It's always about the body. It's always about the family. And when we all get out of the way and put our ministries aside and go, I'm called to be a seeker of God and I'm called to be a builder of the house of God and I'm just gonna find ways to do it. It's amazing what happens. And then you'll find people around you go, you know what? You're a real encourager. 
Oh, I am. Oh, there it is in Romans 12. See, because it flows out of this calling. We need to know that our calling is equal. We're all called to seek God, to put Him first and to build the house of God. So what's the third thing? Oh, no, I need to talk about this. So how do we do this? I love this. Well, we are to be one another's. You say, what is he talking about? Do you know the Bible in the New Testament is full of this phrase, one another? Look at this. The Bible teaches us to love one another, to forgive one another, to forbear one another. That means putting up with people. To be kind to one another, to submit to one another, to comfort one another, to consider one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. That's what the body is all about. It's not about who's the leader or who's preaching or who's on the door. That, 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 that's the manifestation of this. We are the church gathered today, but at, when this meeting's finished and we're finished in the cafe, we're gonna be the church scattered. We're gonna be the church distributed. And what are we to do? One anothering. <laughs> we're to be busy one anothering each other. We're, we're to be loving, we're to be kind, we're to be submitting, we're to be um, uh, 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 forgiving, we're to be all these one anotherings. That's how we build the church, one anothering. See, the moment we decide to do this, we're right in sync with God. Isn't that amazing? See, see here's what I've discovered. I've actually met a lot of pastors that don't build the church. It's all about them. I've met a lot of Christians. They're not building the church. They're not even seeking God. They're pulling the church down. But you see, the moment you and I put our hand up and say, God, I'm gonna seek you all my life. You're number one. And number two, I'm gonna put your people next and I'm gonna build and encourage the church. Have a guess what happens? We get in sync with God. Here's what I've discovered. When you're in sync with God, even bad stuff can turn out okay. All things work together for good to those who love God. Not just spiritually, but practically. Not just in word, but in deed and truth. See, and we get in sync with God. The Bible says we are co-labourers together with Him in 1 Corinthians 3. You know, when my family was little and we were growing, I was only a young dad and, and we were growing up in New Zealand where it really got cold. Just putting it out there. Minus five degrees, freezing. You know, sometimes the wood that I used for my fireplace was frozen. I had to bring it in and put, just bring it inside to thaw out and put it in front of the fire so that it would warm up enough to catch a light. <laughs> Amazing. But you know, sometimes I ran out of wood because it was such a cold night. You'd go through the wood and so often in the middle of the night, like 10 o'clock at night or nine o'clock just before our oldest boy was going to bed, I'd go out to get some wood. And at the time, I remember he was like pretty young and I'd go out and I'd get a sack like this and I'd be pulling a sack of wood into the back porch to unpack it and bring it inside. He'd have to come out with me. Dad, I'm gonna help you. So, oh man, this is never gonna turn out good. And so I'd get the sack over my back and he'd grab a hand on the edge of the sack. But the trouble, he'd be pulling it. And, and it, it, was, it was worse to carry with him pulling it than me just to do it. And it'd be so easy as a father to say, get inside, you waste of my time, man, this is killing me. You know, and I'd be pretty legitimate to say that because it's cold and it's late. But you see, a wise father, he lets the son think he's helping. And so we come inside, he runs up to mum and he goes, Mum, I carried in the wood with dad. See, that's what it's like when we're co-workers together with God. God's got the sack of His concerns. But you know what He lets us do? Grab the corner of the sack. And He's carrying the load. He's actually doing the work. He's actually building the church. But He's invited you and me to just hold the corner. Isn't it sad when people say, look what I did. I'm into galactic ministries, number one. But it wasn't you, it was God. 
you got the privilege to just hold the corner of the sack of our Heavenly Father and to do the ministry. But you know what I've discovered? When you think like that about ministry, you're relaxed. You're not struggling, you're not striving because you know it's His work. You're just a co-labourer together with God. God's working all the time and He's invited you and me to build the house of God with Him. Amazing, isn't it? The last one, we're to be bringers. Bringers of what? The presence of God. Ephesians chapter 2, 22. In Him, Christ, we are being built together as a habitation of the Spirit. You know, the Old Testament, the ark was carried on the shoulders of the priests. One day, the, David, the king, he tried to carry it on an oxen and a cart. And someone tried to touch it, tried to, oh, I can steady what God's doing. I can bring balance to what God's doing. And that was the Old Testament days, not under grace. Lightning came out of heaven and struck him. And David sought the Lord and then he read and he discovered, no, I can't bring it on a man-made cart. It has to be carried on the shoulders of a God-created being, a priest. You and I are priests in the house of God to carry the presence of God. At home, at work, at uni, at school, wherever we go, we carry the presence of God. And that's why when we come together like this, we all bring the presence of God together, if you know what I mean. And it's so powerful, isn't it? And when we're all worshipping and we're all praying and united and we're in sync with God, that's the place of power. That's the place of healing. That's the place of miracles we're called to bring in the presence of God. Paul put it this way, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Took about a double-double. I thought filled was filled, but he said, no, you're gonna be filled with the fullness. <laughs> that we might be carriers of the presence of God. I will dwell with them, Paul said, and walk with them and they shall be my people and I'll be their God. So how do we bring the presence of God? Through our prayers living that prayerful life through our worship, not just worshipping on Sunday, but a spirit of thanks and praise. We find ourselves humming a tune as we thank God for everything. You know, yesterday, our family had its first get together since the whole COVID thing. Man, what a party. Screaming and I felt sorry for the neighbours. But you know, I remember just helping out, getting some seats and helping Pastor Joe get some of the food ready and all that. And all the kids are laughing. You know what I felt in my heart? Worship. I just felt, thank you, God. This is what it's all about. It's about people. It's about family. And that's how we should be in church. You know, when we come to church, just sit there and go, God, thank you. Look at this. Thank you, God. Oh, I don't like the colour of the seats. Oh man, if, I hope he didn't sing that song again. They've sung it three times already. See, so we need that worship. Worship doesn't just mean a song. It's a position. It's an attitude. It's an approach. God, I'm thankful, thankful to You. Through our giving, as we give in tithes and offerings weekly, as we give to vision builders. So we're not only building the house spiritually, we're building it naturally. It's a representation. People say, how important is building a physical building. Well, I'll tell you, I'll put it this way. Go buy a block of land and try to build a church and see what happens. Demons come from everywhere. But just to be a little church in a little hall somewhere isolated, but to come on a main road and go, we're here for Jesus, I'll tell you what, stuff happens. Number of pastors I've had ring me over the years. Pastor, you've got to come and see me. <laughs> Something's gone wrong. Our church is getting attacked and I don't know what it is. And I just say, well, I know what it is. He said, what's that? You bought a building last year. <laughs> it's true because it's the incarnation. It's not just a spirit. Yeah, they're a nice church, they're spiritual. But now it's physical and it's in the landscape and it's saying something. I'll tell you, your giving is incredible. Your giving is incredible. And you know, Joe and I continue to give. We continue to tithe. We continue to give to the building fund. 
Why? Well, well, because this is our family. This is our church. This is our home. This is, this is where God's placed us. So not only am I to pray and to worship, I'm also called to give. But oh, what a blessing in the giving. You'll never lack anything. You might give with a teaspoon, but I'm telling you, God's coming into your world with a back end loader, baby. He's gonna meet your needs, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. And finally, through our service, we are called to serve God. People say, oh, He means rosters. No, 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 no. That's just a manifestation. No, we're here to serve from day one, 24-7. As a matter of fact, do you know how you find out if you're a servant or one who serves? If you're a person who just serves, when you serve, you're on a roster. But if you've got a servant's heart, you'll find yourself helping your wife with the dishes. Helping your wife vacuum the house. Cleaning up your room for mum and dad. Just to please them, just to serve them, just to appreciate. You'll find yourself talking to the stranger in the cafe. Oh, but I'm not on the follow-up team. Oh, well, if I'm on the follow-up team, I'll follow up the strangers. Now, you see, when you're a servant, you, you don't see positions, you just see the church. And when you see a lonely person, you go, why isn't the follow-up team looking after them? This church is not happening properly. No, no, no. You just go over with an extra coffee. Hi, my name's Gordon. How are you? This is your first time at church. Well, See, that's the serving heart. When we get that happening, now we're seekers. Now we're builders. Now we're bringing in the presence of God. Has this helped anybody this morning? We're gonna pray a prayer and then we're gonna finish. Maybe this morning you find yourself away from God, either because you've never received Him or you have and you've drifted. And it doesn't matter whether you're physically in the meeting and you're online, you can pray this prayer for the first time or to come back. Why don't we bow our heads and pray this prayer out loud after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to You. I give You my life. I believe that You died for me and that You rose again. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean and make me new. Today, I decide to follow You all the days of my life. Amen. Wow. What an incredible... Good morning, C3. God in the city. Phenomenal. We're called to be God seekers. We're called to be God builders. And that's the true thing, that the moment you start seeking God, drawing near to Him, He begins to change you, transform you, all the stuff you're carrying, all the stuff you're not meant to carry. And wherever you've been, whatever you've done, He transforms you, He saves you, He redeems you and your life becomes different. And because we're so aware of what He's done, redemption is so fresh and His grace is real. We wanna serve Him, we wanna do something for Him. So it's impossible to just seek God and not wanna build something for Him. And that's what the greats in the Bible did. They sought Him and they began to build a place for God to be worshipped and God place for God to dwell. The third point there was that we're called to carry His presence, carry that anointing, the Spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ. And uh, the key to that is to serve people, to serve one another. We serve three directions. We serve God and we serve our leaders. We serve each other, which is most of the serving we do is serving one another. And we serve the harvest, we serve the world. That's why God has put us in the world, but we're not of the world. The, the way that the world doesn't get on, on us and begin to manipulate and change us is that we go into the world with Christ, with the knowledge of our identity and strength, but we serve the world. We don't come in to lord it over the world. We come and we serve the world. We pray for people. We're kind to people. We ring them up and find out how they're doing in these times of lockdown. We, we buy them a gift, we write them a card go to the coffee shop and we impact people's world because we build relationships outside the walls of our house. And that is such a key point. When you begin to serve one another, you might think, well, I'm not sure I'm, 
even ready for that or stood on the construction, no matter where you're at, regardless of the stage of your maturity or growth as a Christian, everyone can serve someone. And I know that when we serve each other, we release the aroma of Christ. We release the presence of God. Serving releases the presence of God. Jesus asked the disciples to, you know, He said, hey, I wanna wash your feet. And they go, no, 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 we won't have a bar of it. He said, listen, if, if you don't let me wash your feet, you'll have no part in me. You'll be severed from me. The Spirit was travelling through Christ. He said, if you don't let me serve you, you won't have any part. That's a powerful thought there. Because when we serve Christ and we serve each other, we serve the harvest, we bring Christ into our world. Why don't you have a think this week about who you can serve? Maybe you could go out of your way to serve somebody somehow, some way. In this time of lockdown, just do a ring around, just jump on the phone. So I'm gonna ring five people and just gonna see how they're doing. And if you're more concerned about other people than yourself, you'll find, hey, you're probably gonna be going better than you thought you were. And we can get so consumed about how we're going. There's always somebody doing it a whole lot worse than you. I don't wanna discount maybe the season you're in, but I wanna tell you, you've got something to give. And you've got Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of the world. The same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead is in you, whether you feel like it or not. When you begin to serve, you release the power of God over your life. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ here today, Maybe you're away from God and you came back because you know, maybe the life you're living is just not right. I just need to get right with God. I need to get back on track. And you pray that prayer that Pastor Gordon led you into. Surrender your life afresh to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Or if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we wanna stay in touch with you and help you grow. We wanna be connected with you because you're not meant to do this journey on your own. We wanna serve you and help you walk through whatever you're walking through right now. So we wanna stay in touch. We'd love to hear from you. The easiest way to do that, it's so simple. Just send us a simple email, info at godinthecity.com.au. Info at godinthecity, all one word, .com.au. Send us an email and say, hey, I prayed that prayer today. Could you pray with me? We're gonna give you a call, pray with you. We wanna stay in touch, help you grow. God loves you too much to keep you stuck where you're at. He's paid the price of all your sin. He's made a way where there's no way. Don't ever think there's a way out of whatever you're facing. Don't ever think it's the end of the world because hope takes heart that God can always do something. No matter how bad you think it is, God can invade and pierce the darkness of your world and come in and redeem you and pull you up out of the fiery clay or the pit or wherever you're at. This is your day to rise and shine, church. This is your day to stand up in Christ. This is your day to declare the Word of God and to seek His face. And you'll find that your God is far bigger than everything you and I face. Now I'm on a preaching mode. I'm gonna wind it up here right now. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank You for every new person today. Lord, every visitor, every person that prayed that prayer online, I pray that we would get to meet and connect and grow with You. I thank You for all our church, our mighty saints, soldiers, servants and sons. God, I thank You, they're the best church in the world. We love You, church. We're so proud of You. Stand strong, keep walking. Don't forget to jump online if you're all the mighty men. Wednesday nights at seven o'clock for 40 minutes. Shot in the arm, it's gonna be a great time of connection and prayer and a short message. This week we have Brendan Giles coming onto our men's night, seven o'clock Wednesday night. And on Thursday night, we've got a women's night. It's gonna be so powerful with Pastor Kiralee and Tish and all the team. So it's gonna be great on Thursday night for the women. And you got connect groups on Zoom. Stay connected, God bless. We're gonna stand, we're gonna sing one more song just as we close out the day. Be safe, be blessed, go well.